Antarctica is one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. It is the coldest, driest and windiest continent. The only way humans can survive here is by building shelters. But these shelters look very strange. They are bright, futuristic structures made of curved angles that stick out anachronistically from the flat white environment. They seem to be built not for Earth, but for life on some other distant planet. So why do Antarctic stations look like this? A good case study is Halley 6, a research station operated by the British Antarctic Survey. It is composed of eight modular units attached by bridges and gangways to form a 190 metre long structure painted in bright reds and blues. These modules contain everything the crew need to live and work. Laboratories, living quarters, offices, power generators and social areas. The entire station is mounted on giant skis and raised four metres off the ground, resembling some kind of cross between a space station and a giant caterpillar. But despite its unusual appearance, everything at Halley 6 has been built with good reason. The station must endure a brutal climate. It is situated on the Brunt Ice Shelf, a floating extension of ice from the Antarctic continent. Temperatures here can drop to below minus 50 degrees centigrade, wind speeds can reach 150 miles an hour, and during the winter months, the landscape is plunged into constant darkness. Snowfall is minimal, averaging one meter per year, but the snow here does not melt. Instead, it builds up, slowly burying anything beneath it. This phenomenon has been a major problem for Halley 6's predecessors. Halley 1 was a traditional hut with a pitched roof, constructed in 1956. By 1968, it had been crushed by 14 meters of snow, forcing it to be abandoned. Future iterations did not fare much better. Halley 3 was built within a specifically designed tube of corrugated steel. This stopped the station from being destroyed, but did not prevent its gradual burial beneath the snow. Years after it had been abandoned in 1983, the station would reappear, emerging cross-sectioned from a coastal cliff. To avoid a similar fate, Halley 6 is mounted on hydraulic legs, which are used to raise the station off the ground. Great care is taken to minimise the effects of snow buildup. The station is arranged in a straight line perpendicular to the prevailing wind, so that snow drifts form on the leeward side. This leaves the windward side free from drifts, reducing snow management requirements and creating a hard icy surface across which vehicles can easily move. Every summer, operators retract the legs one by one and pack snow underneath, raising the station back above ground level and preventing it from being buried. Giant skis are mounted on the underside of the legs. These are used as a form of foundation to distribute the load out on the ice, but they also allow the station to be moved. This is another feature necessitated by Halley 6's extreme environment. The Brunt ice shelf is continually moving, floating west into the Weddell Sea. This movement triggers carving, when chunks of the ice shelf break off as icebergs. These carving events can threaten to cut the station off from the mainland, and so Halley 6 is designed to be relocatable. To do this, the individual units are separated, their legs are fully retracted, and then the modules are pulled along their skis by a small fleet of tractors. Carving is a natural part of an ice shelf's life cycle, but in some areas of the Antarctic Peninsula, ice shelves have become more unbalanced and unpredictable as a result of changing sea temperatures. These changes have a direct impact on the global climate, contributing to rising sea levels. To understand these kinds of important issues affecting our world, I use the sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is a non-partisan website and app that brings together news from around the world and across the political spectrum, helping you see the bigger picture and form your own conclusions based on all the facts. While researching for this video, I searched Ground News for an article on Antarctica and found this story about global sea ice cover hitting a record low in 2025. Ground News found 82 articles covering the story, with original perspectives adding more nuance than any single news source could. Ground News breaks down the political leanings of each article and provides a biased comparison that identifies opposing viewpoints. Sources across the political spectrum agree that the story is a cause for serious concern and quote the same pair of researchers. However, left-leaning headlines describe sea ice change with emotionally charged terms like in trouble and emphasize the severity of climate change, while right-leaning sources highlight potential new shipping routes and geopolitical implications. We can see a graphic of this bias distribution, the article's factuality and an ownership breakdown, showing the type of news sources referenced and who owns them. To gather all this information on your own for countless sources would involve hours of difficult research, but Ground News makes it simple. Go to ground.news forward slash looped or scan my QR code for 40% off the same vantage plan I use to dig deeper on the important stories shaping our world. This allows you to stay informed and support my work, all for only $5 a month. Now, back to the video. Halley 6 was first moved from its original location in 2016, in response to a large crack named Chasm 1 that was forming in the ice shelf. To avoid a possible carving event caused by Chasm 1, 
Halley 6 was pulled 23 kilometers upstream from the crack to a new location where the units were reconnected and raised. Once they've dropped all those skis down, then the whole station is just jacked up in a kind of Mexican wave motion, 50 millimetres at a time, uh, each building in turn, until it can be raised about a metre or a metre and a half above the snow level again. The strange legs of Halley 6 might be the station's most noticeable feature, but it's what sits on top of them that really matters. The station is divided into eight modules, which are constructed from fibreglass panels and lined with 220 millimetres of closed cell foam insulation. The units are divided into five standard modules, two energy modules, and a single larger central module. Two of the standard modules contain laboratories where researchers carry out scientific work. Meteorology and ozone monitoring, tropospheric chemistry, climate space weather, upper atmospheric observations, glaciology of the Brunt ice shelf. To facilitate this, both modules have roof racks for experimental equipment, and one is fitted with a meteorological observatory deck. The other standard modules contain administrative offices, a doctor's surgery, and sleeping areas. The energy modules house a combined heat and power generator running on aviation turbine fuel that can be stored at extremely low temperatures, as well as water production and waste disposal facilities. The energy modules sit at either side of the bridge and service different sides of the station. Each half has its own energy centre and is self-sustaining in case of emergency. A bridge link allows sharing of power, drainage and water. The central module is the largest and has been designed to be the station's hub. Facilities here include a kitchen and dining room, as well as a lounge, bar, gym and TV room. The area is overlooked by a massive central window that provides panoramic views of the environment and floods the space with natural light during the summer months. Installing this window came with its own problems. Of course, the big risk of using glass is that you lose a lot of heat. So we ended up using some special double glaze panels filled with nanogel which is a highly insulated material which was originally developed for the space industry. The decision to build large windows in the central module, despite the technical challenges associated, is indicative of a general commitment to transcend the purely functional considerations of Antarctic architecture. Stations need to be resistant to the climate, but they must also be livable, somewhere that can offer comfort and solace to crew members, despite the isolation inherent in their environment. There are a series of design choices that have been made expressly for this purpose. Rooms in Halley 6 are painted with a specific palette designed by a colour psychologist to be bright and uplifting. Bedrooms are fitted with a specially designed alarm clock that mimics morning sunlight to help fight disorientation in the dark winter months. A spiral staircase in the central module is lined with cedar veneer, not because it is warm or cheap or practical, but because it gives off a natural smell, a sensory reminder of forests in a place without vegetation. Functional and aesthetic design considerations combine at Halley 6 to create a unique building. The same is true of other Antarctic stations. Brazil's Comandante Faraz station is situated on King George Island. It does not need to be relocatable. Instead, it is designed to harness the solar and wind power available in the area, with wind turbines and photovoltaic panels supplying a large part of the station's energy. The South Korean Jangbogo station at Terranova Bay uses an aerodynamic triple arm structure to resist the strong winds that come into the bay from all directions while India's Bharati station incorporates prefabricated shipping containers, allowing for fast construction in an area with limited accessibility. Each station possesses its own unique design, reflecting the specific needs of its location. The future of Antarctic architecture might extend beyond the frozen continent. The principles used in Antarctic research stations can be applied to building in an even more challenging environment, space. Both places are extremely isolated, inhospitable and hard to access. Working outdoors can only be done for short periods and with specific equipment, making construction incredibly difficult. For this reason, modular prefabricated solutions, like those used in Antarctica, are likely to be the best approach for building in space. Minimum temperatures on planets like Mars are even colder than the Antarctic, reaching minus 133 degrees. Therefore, similar forms of insulation will be necessary. Likewise, materials in both locations need to be lightweight and easy to transport, whether they are being pulled across an ice shelf or flown in a rocket. Of course, buildings in space will encounter a range of other challenges that are completely absent in terrestrial architecture. Lack of oxygen, weaker gravity and cosmic radiation, to name a few. However, there are other, more subtle ways that Antarctic architecture can contribute to space habitation projects. Inhabitants of an outer space settlement are likely to experience the same feelings of loneliness and isolation. The psychological problems of keeping humans sane in space and on ice can be very similar and there are lessons to be learnt. How you deal with isolation, 
how you create a sense of community while giving people personal space, how you support people in the darkness. Evidence from Antarctica has demonstrated that leisure facilities, open social areas and quiet spaces are an important part of avoiding alienation in isolated environments. In the same way, design choices like the prioritization of natural light, the use of bright color palettes and the inclusion of natural motifs can help improve the mood of crew members. In these ways, Antarctic buildings might represent a preliminary form of space architecture and, one day perhaps, stations like Halley 6 might finally live up to their spaceship-like appearance.